Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I welcome you today at Jesus' Lord Ministries International. Pray you're having a great day, a great week, great month. The weather here in central Pennsylvania is absolutely beautiful today. Late or uh, mid to high 50s right now, a little bit of a breeze, the sun's shining. I can spend hours just thanking Lord, the Lord for what he's doing, what he's done. I love creation. Ever since I got saved, creation has just become so much more. Uh, it's like when your eyes are open, when the Spirit fills you, you, all of a sudden you just see everything so much in a different light. I like to look at animals and trees and plants and everything. It's God's creation. He's made it for us. You know, he, he, he uh, spoke the world into existence and all that's on it with us in mind. This was created for us to be here. And inhabit him so I'm just grateful for that and uh, that that's how we rise above difficult situations you know we don't get sucked into what's happening in the world as much as just being thankful that God is in control he, he still sits on the throne even Satan has to serve God I mean when he comes before God he's he, he has to bow and put his head in the dirt so we just have to remember that nothing is is done without God. I mean, he's he's in control, and that's where our, our confidence is, not in this world, not in politics, not in any of that stuff, but in Jesus Christ. Our hope and our waiting is for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and uh, so um, we we keep our attention where we need to keep our attention. Heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus said, "My words will endure forever." So. We can't hold on to everything forever. It's going to pass away. But God and his words and Jesus and the Holy Spirit will continue on. Let's pray and we'll, we'll get into the word. Father, I thank you in the name of your son, Jesus, Lord, for your blessing today. Touch each one of us, Lord. Let our hearts be open and ready to receive. Let your word land where it needs to land, Father. Let us make whatever correction we need to make. Let us uh, be pliable. And like the potter, like the clay, Lord, you, you're the potter. Work us and mold us, God. Shape us. Let your word have impact in our life. Let we can, can change and conform to it, Lord. Let our minds be renewed. Refresh us today, God, with your spirit. Send down a touch for each one of us, Lord, of peace, love, joy. Father, touch us today. And we just thank you, God, and we ask for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. I love the Lord, and I believe that you do as well. Let's jump in the Word. Matthew 11, chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Let's read this quickly. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in their home cities. When John heard it in prison about the works of Christ, he sent his disciples and asked him, Are you the one coming, or do we look for another? Jesus answered, saying to them, Go and tell John the things which you see and do hear. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have received the gospel preached to them. And blessed is the man who is not offended because of me. <clears throat> it's interesting, even then when Jesus was there, that there was some questions about is this the one that we wait for is he the messiah but what does jesus say what is it that you see what what has arrived what signs and wonders because obviously jesus fulfilled the prophecy that these things would happen and jesus said this is the the sign that the christ has come the blind see the lame walk the dead are raised the lepers are cleansed the deaf hear all these things the gospel was preached to the poor. These are the signs that Jesus has come. And it's interesting to me today because it seems like many people are still waiting for something else. They're waiting for some other, some other king. And Jesus even said in John 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 43, I've come in my Father's name, but you don't receive me. But if another one would come in his own name, him you'll receive. And I thought about that as I meditated on this, that many times people are looking for something new. They're looking for, we have this cultural thing of we always got to have the latest thing, the new thing. And Jesus says it clearly there that 
I come in my Father's name in signs and wonders and powers, but many people re refuse that, but that yet some other person or some other thing will come and, and that they'll receive. It's just sad, really. Matthew 11, again, chapter 11, verse 7, it says, As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning what John had said, What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man in, in, in fine clothing? Indeed, those who wear that type of clothing are king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I say to you more than a prophet, for this is he of whom the word is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of woman, there is not risen one greater than John. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John's coming. Look at verse 14. This is what I wanted to, to see here. And Jesus says to them, And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears, let him hear. Do you see what Jesus said? If you're willing to receive it. Many times we're waiting for future events. We have this tendency to be looking into the future all the time for things to come, but, but many of the things that we want are already here. What is, the, what is the ingredient to receive the things that we want? Jesus says, if you are willing to receive it. If you are willing to receive it. We are in, in a great falling away. We are in the Laodicean age, church age. What did Jesus say about the Laodicean church? Let's look at it in Revelation. It's not a negative message. It's a more of a message of, while one church, there's two churches on the earth right now, God's church and then a, a, a form of godliness, but they deny the power. So right now, today, there are two churches at work. And they're very different. But look at Revelation 3. Let's look at some of the things that he talks about. The Laodicean church, what was one of their problems was they, uh, Jesus said, I know your works and these different things. But it says, because you say that, that, you, that you need nothing. Let me find it here. Chapter 2, Revelation I'm sorry, chapter 3. Let's look at chapter 3. You say that you need nothing, but Jesus says that you, you're dead, you're naked, you're empty. And I, you can see that in America a little bit. You, you can see that uh, we, we, we've fallen into that category, that place. Yeah, the church, it's, it's in chapter 3, verse 14. It says, the angel to the church of the Laodiceans. I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. So because you're just lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's pretty strong wording. Well, let's look at verse 17, though. This, is, this was the problem, and this is the church age that we're in. We're in this. Obviously, these were real churches in that time that Jesus spoke this, but all of them apply to us, all of the churches that he wrote letters to. These are the words of Jesus here, but this is what he says. Because you say, I am rich, I'm wealthy, I'm in need of nothing. But you do not know your wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He says, I counsel from you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you will be then rich, and your, your garments will be white, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with that you may see. And as many as I rebuke, I love. And I chasten them. Be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come unto him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So 
we need we should know at what age we're in we are in that age because the great falling away is really now if the bible says the love of many will grow cold well that's happening now churches are are kind of watering down the gospel and we don't want to offend anybody so we're not most people won't stand up for the word they'll 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 yield to the feelings and and conditions of man's mind but that's not what jesus said so while one church is turning away and falling away another one is actually turning towards the lord isaiah 55 6 says seek the lord while he may be found call upon him while he's near let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts let him return unto the lord and he will have mercy on him and to our god for he will abundantly pardon his sin I think this is a great opportunity in the age that we're in for the, the real church to, 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 to draw closer to God, to cleanse our own hands, to cleanse our own minds, to, to repent of our own sin and press into God. As the crazier the world gets, the, the, the more we should be drawing in to Jesus. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst, for they will be filled. God promises us, Jesus said, if you seek me, you will find me. If you press into me, you will receive what I have. And the thing is, see, Jesus said, what if another comes in my name or in, in his own name, you would receive him, but you can't receive what's already here. What the problem is, is we've rejected what God's already done in many instances. If you look at Joel 2.28, the Bible says it'll come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Verse 29. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. You know, that's already happened. That was 2,000 years ago God poured out his spirit. But for some reason it, it seems like People are still waiting for God to do something. But I believe he's already done it. The question is, will we receive it? Will we seek after what God's already done? Remember in, in the upper room, it says the day of Pentecost fully came and they were in one accord and the spirit of the Lord came. Tongues began to erupt out of the men of God that were there and the women. But do you see today, we, are we seeking these things? Are we... Are we desiring these things or are we waiting for another? Because the problem is those who are waiting for another, it's not going to come when the, when, when the one is already here. Look at Isaiah 28, 11. It says, for with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to his people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherein you may cause the weary to rest. This is the refreshing, but yet they wouldn't hear do you see, God's already poured out his spirit. It's already here. The Holy Ghost is already here to dwell in the believers. But many times he's rejected. The move of God is rejected. We're drawn to fancy words and philosophy and vain imaginations of men. But we reject many times the move of God. We reject the spirit of God. And looking a little bit at jeremiah's life you know jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet because of the tremendous hardships that he had to go through to bring forth the word of the lord he was one you know that was kind of an outcast because people didn't want to hear the truth they were more interested in the tickling ear things and, I've, and that's part of the this church age we're in is where the bible says men will be drawn to things that tickle their ears they're not drawn to holiness. They're not drawn to the real move of God. They're drawn to the things of comfort, the things you get, they get sucked into a certain part of the gospel, but not every part, not the fullness of it. Look what Jeremiah says in uh, chapter 7, verse 25. He says, since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them to you. Yet they hearken not unto me, nor incline their ear, but harden their neck 
and they did worse than their fathers did. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hear you. You shall call unto them, but they will not answer you. These are the words of Jeremiah, because they rejected the word of the Lord, because Jeremiah's Words from, from God were strong. It was about correction. It was about judgment. It was about turning back to the Lord. And See, in, in a time of blessing, nobody wants to hear that. And that's what happened to Jeremiah. In times of goodness, but do you see, it, right before things go south or when they're in their greatest season, and that's what Jeremiah was facing. You see, they were profaning the temple in, in Jeremiah's day. Sin was rampant. The priest and the pastors and whatever were doing, it was all corruption and extortion. And, and, and that's kind of what we're, we're falling into today. But there's Jeremiah's in the land today, but nobody wants to hear what they have to say. Because when a prophet brings a word and it's something like Jeremiah, it, people reject it. They don't want to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that trouble could come. Or that judgment could, that nobody wants to hear that. We, we don't allow those thoughts in our mind because we only want what's comfortable for us. And that's the Laodicean church age. And Jesus said, you think you need nothing, he said. You think everything's great. You're, you're, you're rich, you're wealthy, you're prosperous. Things are going great. But Jesus said, the reality is you're, you're naked and blind. You see what he said about Cry out to God that the, the salve, the eye salve, the anointment would come on your eyes that you'd be able to see. He was talking that, 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 that many church uh, Christian people, they're blind to the things of the spirit. They're, they're in a false kind of religious setting versus the real thing. That's kind of what was happening here. Poor Jeremiah, though. I mean, he, they threw him in a cistern and they, they left him to die. But he was rescued from that. I tried to just, looking at his life a little bit, I could just see, my goodness, he really went through it for the Lord. But he, he, he just, his, his number one thing was, I'm just going to be faithful to the calling of God on my life. And <laughs> for Jeremiah, definitely there was nothing easy about it. Maybe sometimes we, we make people feel like when they come to Christ, everything will just be easy. But that, that's not the case many times. But then that person has to decide who are they going to serve. Look at what Jeremiah said though, in, in verse uh, chapter 20 and verse 9. He said, I, I, then I said, I will not make mention of him anymore. He was talking about the Lord. Nor will I speak anymore in his name. But look what happened because of that fire, that Holy Ghost. And look what he says. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not be quiet. Wow. That's powerful. As hard as it was for Jeremiah, and then people turned against him. I mean, he, his, his life was not well. He was abused and thrown in that to die and all these things. But yet he said, I, I will not be quiet. I will preach the word of the Lord. Because it's burning in him like a fire. And that's the season we're in now, too. As, as things get tighter, as persecution rises, even in America for the Christian church, we'll begin to see who has these things shut up in their bones. And I think many people will quickly turn away. But the problem is we've never been persecuted. We have a whole generation or generations that have never had persecution. So if persecution were to come, how long will they last? Only the Jeremiah's are going to be the ones refusing to back down. Most other people will just quickly turn away. The Laodicean church wouldn't be able to handle any kind of persecution. And what was the problem? In Revelation 2, it talks. this is another church he talks about uh, the issue that they had. We could relate to, we could watch, because as it gets i mean right now the church is drifting farther and farther away every day they're a little bit farther but in that moment every day god is also calling in another church to be even more committed more surrendered it's happening at the exact same time and you see that because we're in the age of tolerance 
they want the church to tolerate everything, which eventually would just throw out everything that Jesus ever taught. Tolerance would overrule all of the teachings of the Bible if the church lets it. And you see that's already happening quickly. And once you open the door to corruption and sin and rebellion, it, it's a free-for-all after that. Because once the devil gets in, he could do what he wants. And we're in that hour. Remember, it says they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. You see, without the power, there's no transformation. Without the spirit, the word has no effect. It needs to have both. The Bible says we worship in word and truth, spirit and word. We got to have them both. But when we push out God, when we push out the Holy Spirit, we're left with just word. And that's not going to change anybody. It's the spirit of God that changes the heart of man. Through the word. But look what Jesus said the problem was here. He said to them, I have something against you. You left your first love. That's what happened. That's what's happening in America now. In our, in our churches, our Christian culture. We left our first love. You know how you could tell that? Like people will come to church on Sunday but have a prayer meeting on Friday night or something. And, and the attendance, <clears throat> nobody will come. Or hardly anyone will want to come. You could just see Wednesday night, people aren't that interested. Sunday night, they're busy. Saturday, they're busy. But they can make the half hour on Sunday. But what's happened? The love of God. Is, we've grown cold. And Jesus is saying, return back to your first love. Remember where you came from is what he says, basically, in Revelation 2. And he says, repent. And do the first works, meaning go back to where you first fell in love with Jesus. Go back to when Jesus was number one. Go back to when he was priority in your life. And he has strong words here in these churches to bring correction to it. But he says, or I will come quickly and remove your candlestick out of its place unless you repent. See, people probably don't like that type of thought either. I mean... <laughs> The, the, a lot of groups believe once saved, always saved. You know, that, that we've made things to just be whatever. Just believe in Jesus and do what you want. And, and uh, you know, don't worry about it. There's no judgment and all this stuff and whatever. But I don't know. Jesus here, or else I will remove thy candlestick. I will remove you out of your position, basically, unless you repent. I'm a big fan of repentance. I, I love it and because that's our way into the Father when we, when we mess up. Or that's our way to be restored. It always comes through repentance. So it's an important word and, and understanding to be in our lives, to repent, to repent. I've met Christians already that said, I don't know why I need to repent. Christian people, they believe in God. They believe in Jesus. But they said, I don't, I don't see the reason. They're thinking everyone else is bad and they're good. But they don't know the Bible that well because that's the guy in the synagogue that looks over and says, oh, I'm glad I'm not like that one. But then Jesus says that's the one that's received and the prideful one is rejected. We need to be able to hear that th these messages don't bother me. I'm not offended by this kind of thing. Repent. Go back to your first love. I have this against you. I'm not offended when these strong words come forth. Doesn't bother me at all. Why? Because it helps keep me on my knees. It helps keep me humble. Keeps me from pride. We need to be corrected. We need to hear these stronger things in our Christian walk. It's like a diet. If all you eat is fast food, you're not going to be doing too well. Our Christian walk is just like that. We have to have a diet of everything that God has given us. It's not just blessing. It's not just prosperity. It's not just abundance. Although all those things are there, but the, not everybody walks in that. I've, I've preached recently about the hedge that's around us. Not everybody, not every Christian even has a hedge around them. They have the form of godliness, but there's no hedge. Why? Because the devil is able to get access to them. And how does that come through? It comes through sin. It comes through rebellion. The, the lukewarm Christian church, we, we've, we've been raised, we've, we've taught people. I mean, people are raised up to allow sin in their life. 
we have to get back to the, the basics of the word of God, repentance, holiness, doing things the right way. You know, when we buy cars, you can't, we can't lie anymore on the taxes every time. People do that a lot. Well, I bought the car. How much was it? This was only $1,000. I used to do that before Jesus. You know, you just, you always lied on taxes. But as a Christian now, we can't do that. We have to do things the right way. I'm always trying to do things the right way as I go in life. Do I always do right? No, sometimes I mess up and I repent, but. But I want to I want to live right. You know, in the New Testament, it even says, follow peace with all men and holiness. Without that, no one will see the Lord. I mean, that that's strong words. Walk out your faith with fear and trembling. And I like to stay in that that lane. I don't like to get too comfortable. It's not that I don't think I'm going to heaven, but I tell you, I, I just get a sense that many people take it for granted. They've gotten too comfortable. They've gotten like this. They've gotten like the church that Jesus talked about, the Laodicean church. We have need of nothing. Everything's fine. Everything's good. Don't worry so much. Could you imagine what they said to the prophet Jeremiah when he was telling them that judgment was coming on the land and they shut him up? They threw him in. He actually was tried for like treason because of his words against the kingdom. And nobody wanted to hear it. They threw him out. But yet it turned out that he was the man of God, actually. He was the, 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 you see, the problem is, one of the problems we have is there's so many voices today. There's so many voices today. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what, what is truth. Who, what voice can we trust? There's so many. And Jeremiah's day was probably like that, too, because they also had prophets that were not prophesying correctly. They were prophesying out of their own desire what they wanted to see and that's not what god was was bringing and we we people fall into that sometimes we prophesy what we want to happen we want things to go a certain way right like most christians are always talking about we're going to get raptured out of here before anything happens why that's their desire they're preaching their own desire not <laughs> it's not biblical necessarily that there's nothing in the Bible that says American, the church will be raptured before all hell breaks loose. It doesn't say that in the word, but we preach that. Why? Because it's out of our own desire. You see, we could fall into that easily. We can't preach our desire. We preach what the Bible says. We speak what the Lord says. So we need to we need to be careful and stay on that track that we're, we're not <laughs> prophesying out of our own you know, understanding. Thus says the Lord, all is well. You know, that's what they were doing in Jeremiah's day. So when Jeremiah came with the stronger message, <laughs> they threw him out. He went to prison. He was tried just because of the words that he said. But yet what he wouldn't stop preaching. He said, like a fire. You hear that many times, like a fire shut up in my bones. That's where it came from. Jeremiah himself, through all that persecution, he was not willing to back down. And God is raising up a generation in this hour this is how god will bring the church to life through a little bit of trouble through a little bit of bumpiness you see that's what brings the church to life it knocks us out of that laodicean thing it's hard to stay in that if the rough road is before us it's not you're not going to stay comfortable too easy you'll find out who loves christ and who doesn't i think very quickly most Many people would just fall away. I, I don't know. Too many people aren't going to stand up for Christ or die for him. They're not going to die for him. They're not going to suffer loss for Jesus. People aren't going to do that in America. Other countries they do. Right? China, India, places like that. I just watched the video of a guy. They, they were stoning him. An Indian guy had like a shoe shop because he was Christian. The Muslims stoned him basically. He looked like he was unconscious. They were kicking him. Then they put him in an ambulance and they were broke the windows out of that and were throwing rocks at this poor guy only because of his faith in Christ. How many in America would be able to go through something like that for Jesus? I would think many people would renounce him pretty quickly. But not that man. They drug him off. I mean, they finally were able to protect him with some security and whatever. But he was badly hurt. All because of his faith in Jesus. And they ransacked his store. Throughout all his shoes, they were laughing, putting his shoes on. They took, they, they wrecked his business all because of Jesus. So we, we don't even know what it means to suffer yet. 
we have no idea. But many in, in, in the other nations already are experiencing that. The word would become a lot more real to many when in, in those hours of persecution and, and, and tough, tough weather. I mean, think about the scriptures you would be holding on to if you experienced what that man did. Absolute horrible persecution only because he loved Jesus. Look what Jesus says here in uh, Matthew 11 again. So now more than ever is our time to turn towards the Lord, to, to seek his face, to call upon him, to draw close to him. It's like not training, but we're building ourselves up. For whatever comes our way, we'll be able to withstand. We'll be able to stand by having our roots grounded now, by being filled with Jesus now, not waiting till later. Look what Jesus says here, chapter 11, verse 16. But to what shall I liken this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you. You did not dance. We mourned for you, but you didn't, you didn't listen. You didn't, you didn't lamb it with us. Look at verse 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and you said he had a demon. Now the Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and you say he's a glutton and a wine bitter, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by, by her children. You see, Jesus was saying, you, you reject whatever, whatever God sends, the, the people reject. That's what makes me laugh when people are waiting for revival. I think that's kind of funny, honestly, because they wouldn't they wouldn't receive it if it came. Do you don't understand what revival looks like? Revival looks like casting demons out. Well, right there, that that excludes most of the church world. They don't like that. Well, that's revival. Jesus was revival and everywhere he went, he cast demons out. But yet the church world today, they don't like that very much. But they're they're waiting for something that's already here and they've already rejected. That's what I'm getting at. You see, the Bible says they rejected John because he fasted and didn't and didn't eat and drink. They said he had a demon. And then Jesus comes and he's eating and drinking. You see, Jesus is showing the parallel. You didn't accept the one that was fasting. Now you don't accept the one that was eating. You see, we, we reject what God has already done. Revival is already here. Revival is already right now. We, we, we're waiting for things that are already here. The problem is we've rejected it. The move of God in many places is rejected. The touch of God, the Holy Spirit, tongues, interpretation, words of wisdom, knowledge, faith, all the gifts of the Spirit, in many places it's rejected. It's, it's thought of as witchcraft in the church. Why? Because people were raised in a powerless church, so they see one little smidget of the move of God and they think it's the devil. That's the church age we live in. The more on fire someone is, the more of the, of the things of God that are there, the more rejection comes to them. You say they're not welcome. When God's moving, the church doesn't celebrate and say, uh, oh, this, look at this. No, they reject it. Why? Because we're, we're missing the move of God right before our eyes. That's the age we're in. How many people will, will jump in their car and drive an hour or two to a revival? Because they hear that signs. Most people won't. You could ask them, hey, I heard God's moving mightily under this tent somewhere. Let's go. No, I can't. I'm busy. I got stuff to do. Maybe another time. That's what most people say, you see. But yet they say they're waiting for revival. It's already here. They've missed it. They're waiting for nothing. Most people won't see revival because they can't even grab a hold of it now. What difference would it make later? What difference would it make later? It won't. They're not looking for it now. How... You know, when John the Baptist was along the river, people ran to him, but other people never went. They said, I'm not going out to see that prophet. I'm not going out to see that crazy guy. I don't believe he's from God. That's, that's the majority of people today. They're not going anywhere to do anything. They're not, they don't believe in the move of God. They, but yet they say they, they can't wait for revival one day. Well, they already missed it, and they'll miss it again. Why? Because they're not that hungry for it. That's what Jesus was trying to say here. You, you've rejected me, but you would go to some other thing. You would receive some other person. 
All around the world, people are waiting for someone. That's why the Antichrist will do so well when he comes, because he's going to fulfill the lust of men's desires. This is the one we wanted. They didn't, we didn't want Jesus. We didn't want God, but we'll take this one. That's exactly what will happen when the Antichrist comes. Christians think it'll be a big deal. It'll be hard. No, people will gladly take the mark. They'll line up for it, just like they did last time. They'll line right up for it. You won't have to force them to do anything. The Antichrist isn't going to have to try very hard. People will already be like, yeah, this is the guy we needed. Why? Because they rejected Jesus. Not everybody, but in, in, less people are choosing Jesus over these other things is what I mean. For you and me and others that are hungry, we, we do choose Jesus, but we're just looking at the season that we're in, the time that we're in, this Leo, they see in church age. Many will fall away. I mean, all through the Bible, it talks about that. Many will fall away. The love of many will grow cold. They'll have a form of godliness, denying the power. Most of the church world in America is that, a form of godliness, denying the power. We don't celebrate revival. We celebrate education, like, you know, fancy preaching. And we, we judge it by the natural. Most Christians judge church by the natural, not by the spiritual. And in that sense, we've totally missed it. Like John the Baptist, many couldn't see that he was the forerunner. But do you know the ones that recognize that, see, you can recognize the move of God. That's what we need to get better at, recognizing when God's moving. Why? So we don't miss it. Recognizing that that really was. See, remember Jesus said, if you'll receive it, that is the spirit of Elijah on that man. That's what Jesus said. When they asked about John the Baptist, Jesus said, no greater man has been born a woman than him. And he said, if you'll receive him, that's the spirit of Elijah. Do you see? Listen to how Jesus said that. If you'll receive him, you can access what he has. Do you see? Honor. And, and, and recognizing the move of God, we have to recognize the anointing on, on men of God's life. You know, many times there's great men and women of God in this world and people can't see the move of God on their life. And what happens? They miss it. Today's church world, we're more attracted to the natural stuff. We'd rather have the coffee bar and the donut shop when we come in the door and, and we don't even know there is a move of God. That's the church of today. We don't even know there is a move of God. But there is a mighty move of God if you can see it, if you can recognize it. See, we spend a lot of time arguing about doctrines. We spend a lot of time, you know, just I uh, was just thinking about the Salvation Army. William Booth had that vision. That this is what caused him to start that in the Salvation Army early days. They would have parades where he would preach. And at the end of the parade, he would have an altar call. What was the vision and dream that God gave him? He showed him Christian people already saved on this big rock. And some are like painting and singing and dancing. And, and others are doing this and others are doing that. Some of them were there just arguing about doctrine. They were just spending all their time. Well, I don't know whether they're arguing about this, arguing about that. And when he said in the dream, as, as, as the view pulled back, you can actually watch it. It's pretty awesome, like an uh, animated version of it. It's powerful, what the dream that he experienced. And he said that they were crying out to God on this rock, God, come, come. And he said as, the, as he pulled back, he could see that there was humanity was out on this ocean behind this rock. And out in the midst of all that is where Jesus actually was. He wasn't on the rock. He wasn't up in the sky the way that they were trying to, they were all distracted. They were all missing what God was really doing, where Jesus is out in the lost sea of humanity, crying, help me, help me, help me, help me. That's what Jesus was doing. But they were there arguing about stuff and doing this, and they're all distracted and, and, and busy with life, and Jesus is out in the ocean of people dying, crying, help me. That's what calls William Booth to begin the Salvation Army, which originally started with the intent to bring people to Christ. He would preach powerful messages after a downtown parade. But do you see how easy we can get sucked into that? Because, see, while revival's taking place, while God is using people, 
We sit around and argue about it. Well, I don't know. I don't know if that's God. I don't know. Blah, 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 blah. We don't like the people God uses. Oh, I don't know about them. I don't know. Meanwhile, God is already doing what he's going to do. We have to decide, are we getting on the train or not? Are we going to ride along with what God's doing? Or are we going to sit back? Because that's the thing. Many people are waiting for revival. They're never going to see it. They're just not going to see it. That doesn't mean that they have to stay that way. But we got to be more open to who is God using in this hour? Because it, sometimes it looks different than what we think it should look like. Our problem is we, we want to dictate how every little thing is. And God ain't going to let that happen. He's just not going to let that happen. He'll mess us up purposely. God's done that to me. I've seen people that God's using. I sit there and think, wow, God, I, I wouldn't have expected that, you know. God pulls people out of anywhere. We don't know who they are. We don't know anything about them. But you can see that God's on them. Power of God is moving through that vessel. Why? Because they're just a yielded vessel. They might not even have the education. They might not have the degrees. But guess what? God is using them. Why? Because they're an open, yielded vessel. We don't want to miss what God's doing. We got to be. We can't control what God's doing. We just have to get in the river and go for the ride. We just got to go for the ride. You see it, you experience that many times with people, you know, that, that people aren't attracted to the move of God because we're raised in a church atmosphere that doesn't have it. So when God is moving, like revival, people don't even know what that looks like. Oh, we're, we want revival in our church. Are you sure? You really want revival? You want repentance? You want demons cast out? You want uncontrollable moves of the spirit? Who knows what might happen? That's revival. Jesus, when he went into towns, he upturned, the, I mean, the cities went into, like, chaos almost because of revival. It wasn't this smooth transaction of events. People tried to kill him. They tried to throw him off rocks and stuff. But meanwhile, the fruit of his life was good. He was healing people, delivering people, helping people. But they didn't like the person, and they didn't like the methods. They didn't like what he was doing, and they rejected him. And that's what plagues our churches today. We reject most of what God's really doing. God's doing all kind of stuff. Revival's happening everywhere now. I don't know what people are waiting for. I think we want to see a move of God that will change America. That's, and we all hope that, but we can hope as long as we want. But the reality is I, I don't know if that's coming. I hope it is. I hear a lot of people say that. I don't want to be negative. But I also say now that God's already, we are in revival now. But the question is, are we going to accept it because of the vessels God's going to use? When you look at who, who God's moving through, a lot of people don't like them. They wouldn't be invited to churches. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't be given the pulpit. They wouldn't be popular amongst like the, the church world. But yet that's what God's doing. Let's look at Ezekiel 36. Well, before I go there one more time, let, let me just see here, because this, this is important to kind of put a cap on that thought. Matthew eleven twenty. 20. Jesus, this is going on in that whole thing. John the Baptist, they ask about him. Jesus says, well, I liken the generation to this. This is the generation we are in now, you see. Jesus has been calling. The Holy Spirit's been moving, but many people are just, duh, they're not responding. That's what the parable was here when he said, it's like children in the marketplace calling out and dancing, but nobody responds to them. That's what Jesus is describing here. We are in that generation now. Nobody's responding. I mean, people are, but generally speaking, this is what Jesus meant. God is moving now. Revival is actually happening now, but many people aren't responding, and they'll miss it. That's what Jesus was saying. But look at this. This, is really, this really gets intense down here. When he talks about to the when Jesus talks about the cities that didn't respond to the move of God, they rejected it. Look what he says here. Verse 20. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works have been done because they did not repent. Do you see when when the works are done like that, when the move of God comes like that, we're now held accountable for it. This generation that we live in now is held more accountable than any other generation before. Because of what God is doing in it. Look at what he says here. Woe to you. He's, he's talking about the cities that he went to and demonstrated the move of God. 
and preached, and they rejected him. Look what he says. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works were done in you, that were done in you, were done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Look at this. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment than for you. And for you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works were done in you, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. What kind of parable is that? That he, Jesus says if Sodom and Gomorrah had the miracles that we have right now today, they would have repented. That's what he just said. We think Sodom and Gomorrah was so bad, and it was. God destroyed them because of their sin. But Jesus said that if these works were done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. Meaning if Sodom and Gomorrah had the move of God that we have right now, they would have repented and turned from their sinful ways. That's hard to believe, isn't it? We're so hard on Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, they were so wicked. The fornification, the, the, the men with men, the women with women, the, 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 the parties and the orgies and all that. We were so hard on them. But Jesus says, if they had what we had right now, today, what you and I have, if Jesus is saying, if they had what you and I have, they would have repented and turned. <laughs> then what he says, look what he says. It'll be more tolerable for the Sodom in the day of judgment than for our generation today. Why? Because of the move of God we've been given. We've been given all that Jesus walked in. That never stopped. That's been the last 2,000 years. Signs, wonders, and miracles. We, we, there, there is nothing else being poured out. This is it. We're in it. We are in it. Deliverance. That's happening today. Healing. That's happening today. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. With evidence of tongues, that's happening today. Everything that Jesus did, the dead being raised, that's happening today. Blind eyes being opened, that's happening today. Leprosy departing, that's happening today. Miracles and signs are right now. So when people say they're waiting for revival, I don't know what they're waiting for. Everything that Jesus did is here today, right now. And not only that, we're responsible for it. Look what he says, I mean... It'll be more tolerable for Sodom. How could Jesus even say that? That's hard to understand. It'll be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than us in, in America today? That's what he means. Why? Because they didn't have the move of God that we have. See? We, we look at Sodom and Gomorrah like we're on an equal playing field with them. We're not. We have more than they ever had. They didn't have the preaching we have. They didn't have the, the you know signs and one. They didn't have any of that. And Jesus said, because we have that, we, we will be without excuse, basically. That's what Jesus is saying. America and whoever, other nations, we will be without excuse on the day that Jesus comes back. None of us will be able to have any kind of, whoa, what do you mean, God? I didn't know. All around us, there's revival. Even in the church, many are rejecting it. But we will be without excuse. Something to think about. Ezekiel 36. talks about what God's will really is for us. So we do have, we look at some of these harder things, but it doesn't end there. It's not a, a message that drops with no redemption <laughs> or no uh, alt alternative option, you could say. Ezekiel, let me find it here. 36, now this is what God wants to do. Remember, the Bible says God takes no pleasure in those that perish. So we're, this isn't about the judgment of God on a country or nation. It's not that. It's just it's us individually. Revival starts in our own heart individually. I'm not worried about the church today or America and all. I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking individually, me, individually, you. That's how revival comes in us personally. But this is what God wants to do in us. Look what he says. Verse 25. Chapter 36 of Ezekiel. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. <clears throat> I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take out that stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. Look at verse 27. I'll put my spirit in you, 
and it will cause you to be able to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and you will do them. That's what God wants for us. You see, God, it, God doesn't have a bad portion for us if we're willing to, to just do what he said, if we're willing to just open ourselves up, cleanse ourselves, repent, and, and say, God, fill me. Every day is my prayer, Lord, fill me today again. Give me the strength today to do whatever I'm doing. Touch me again today. Do you see, these are, these are all the, the wishes of God. But it's going to be for those who want it. Remember, God can't force himself. He sent, he sent John the Baptist. Many people did respond to him, and it was powerful. People cried out to John, what must we do to be saved? What should we do? Even soldiers, I mean, John was a powerful man of God. There was a spirit on him that shook the region, but other people didn't respond to him. Jesus came, mighty signs and wonders. Every religion in the world acknowledges Jesus as a miracle worker. Even the Muslims say Jesus was a powerful miracle worker. He was a prophet. They say everything we say except he was the son of God. They believe everything about Jesus except what you need to be saved, basically. They believe he was a prophet. They believe he was a miracle worker. Jesus around the world is known for science. I mean, no one rejects that he was even a man. Nobody rejects that he did what he did. Nobody argues that. Where does the problem lie? They don't want him to be the son of God which is the very thing that saves us, that we believe that he was the son of God. And many people receive Jesus, and they are today, and many people reject him. You see, Jesus is saying, what more do you want? Basically is what he's saying. What more do you want? I've sent everything. The Holy Ghost, signs, wonders, deliverance, healing, everything, and yet still people reject him. But not you and I. We don't reject him. We, we are calling upon him. Look at Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. We'll close up here with, with this. Come unto me all who are heavy and labor. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. For I'm meek and lonely in heart. You shall find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And let me give you one more scripture. We'll close up. Psalms 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. I encourage you today to be hungry, to be hungry for the move of God, to be chasing the things of God. Don't let it pass by. Don't wait for revival. Don't wait for the move of God when it's already here. Cry out, let God put you into the move of God, put you into revival. Be part of it. Don't be a spectator. Be in the move of it. Be in the flow of it. And I believe that through God's word and the teaching of it, that will help you do that today on your walk. Well, God bless you and have a great day.